for sale for $15 at the Lockpick Village. We're going to have lunch after this at noon. Uh, we're going to be selling old B-side shirts for $5 minimum donation. And that money is going to go to the Rural Tech Fund and the Mental Health Hackers. So all the money is going to go back to the charities. Uh, we ask for a $5 minimum donation. Those should go on sale roughly about 1 o'clock. Uh, next up, or first up for today down here is Judo Threat Intelligence by Frank Angio Lily. Lily? Okay, I'm sorry, I butchered the poor man's name. Hey, everybody. How are you doing today? My name is Frank Angio Lily. I know it's a little hard. I've got all the vowels. I've got like all of them. You don't want to play Wheel of Fortune with me. It's going to be like end in L. There's five L's? No. So, so the only vowel that's not in my last name is you. But don't think I haven't thought about changing it, because I definitely have. One of my daughters actually has a U in her first name, so she's pretty much all covered. So today I'm going to talk to you about judo threat intelligence, and despite this incredible physique, I don't actually do judo. I used to do karate many years ago, but this is far more about walking through a thought process that I've implemented in a lot of organizations. It's a philosophy that deals with a lot of the challenges that we have in the industry, and I think has provided some pretty good results. I hope you get something out of it. Next slide, please. And Neil's doing a great job backing me up on the slide, so thanks very much. So a little bit of background on me. So I've, I've run a number of different security operations centers uh, throughout the country, a lot of New York financials, a lot of government organizations. And as I said, what I'm going to talk to you about today is a philosophy that I've implemented at each of those organizations, and it's really kind of helped. Um, there's a lot of information that, that comes out on the web. There's a lot of things that call for our attention. Okay, but like, what's the most important thing? What's the most important thing that we're supposed to do? Oh, oh don't worry about it, because you'll see that in a cybersecurity news article, right? No, no, so wait a second. So next slide, please. So when we think about intelligence, I always think about the difference between information and intelligence. Right? So there are definitely things that gives us a lot of information. But when we distill that and digest that down into what the heck should I do now? So one of the things I like to say is that the most important decision is what you choose not to focus on, right? Because there's a thousand things calling for your attention. So what is that? And the difference between internal intelligence and external intelligence. So yeah, there's a lot of providers out there that are giving you external intelligence, you know, cozy, fuzzy, happy bear, you know, versus whatever panda, right? We get those reports and they're good, they're valuable, but what's inside of our organization? What can we use in our, and that's primarily what this is going to focus on. And then obviously being actionable and scalable at some level, right? Brute force is not the solution. Next slide, please. So in order to understand what are we dealing with in the security operations, threat intelligence, incident response type world, I wanted to measure this from a couple of different angles. So the chart that you're looking at is a program that I wrote that's downloaded every single cybersecurity news article that's been published from 16 different sources every day since April of 2019. I've done word, word clouds on this. I've done classifi classifiers on it. You see how many of them are malware versus vulnerabilities. And the, the, the meta of this is there's between 30 and 58 articles being published every day. All right, so wait a second. That's a lot of articles. So how many, how much information is in each one of those articles? About 400 words. So let's do some math, and that's approximating half a novel a day. Okay, that's pretty cool, but like, what am I supposed to do with that? I, I can't even read like a novel over like five weeks. Like for, forget, forget about half a novel a day, right? And then underneath, you'll see there's some, some studies there at the bottom talking about noise in the sim world. We all kind of kind of know that that's out there. All right, so setting the stage here, this is kind of the volume of stuff that's being thrown at us on a regular basis, right? There's more to it but this than this. Next slide, please. And that's kind of clear. And so um, as I started building out, you know, larger security operations center, I wanted to search for a strategy. I really wanted something. Who's dealt with this before? Because so, somebody somewhere has dealt with this before. I can't be the first one. And so I looked at some military strategies that are out there. Who's dealt with this? Some historical context, right? A good example of this is the Vikings and England, right? When the Vikings invaded England. They could attack any single point on the whole coast of England at any point in time. 
But England had to defend every single inch of coastline for years, and they pretty much failed at it. That's the kind of idea. And so a guy by the name of Rocky introduced me to Coswitzian theory, which is very interesting. It's like, how do you defend? Like in karate, we have like the iron wall. It's like, how do you defend against this type of stuff? And there's similarities to personal combat tactics, right? So, I mean, if you've ever walked down the street and come up against an aggressive person who's much larger than you, like that's definitely never happened to me, right? I'm not the biggest guy in the world. You can kind of feel where we may stand as defenders. Our, our adversaries are very well funded or they're, they just spend their time developing tools and can attack us at any point. And so I came upon the story of a guy, and I'm going to share this story with you. Next slide, please. Who dealt with something very, very similar to this, entered Dr. Jigoro Kano. So what I really liked about the stories that I read about him is that he was small in stature. To give you an idea, don't quote me on this, but I think he was roughly about five foot two and 95 pounds. And he was very well educated, and he, he wrestled a lot of jiu-jitsu. This is way back in the day. And he lost he won quite a few battles, but when he came up against the top school and the bigger guys, he kept losing. And so what he decided to do was to study the attacker. So as I'm reading through his journal, I came upon these quotes. They basically say, usually it had been him that threw me. And all of a sudden, I started throwing him with increasing regularity. So I really dove deep into that, right? It sounds like something really worthy. And he says it's because of the result of my study on how to break their posture. I said, all right, this has got to be, this has got to be worth something, right? How did he do that? What was that about? And so what he basically figured is that if he applied all of his physical strength and his small stature before he broke the opponent's posture, what he was doing was just wasting his energy. And so I see similarities across the cybersecurity world where, you know, we're experiencing fatigue and burnout, the number of hours that people are working, and just the sheer volume of things that we have to approach. It's like that brute force that Jigoro was applying prior to breaking their posture. And so what I, I've developed out of this is how we could adopt some of those judo principles into what we do. And so I'm going to go through some pragmatic examples of what that actually looks like. And then I'm going to step through some of the methodology that hopefully you can take away from this and find valuable. Next slide, please. So let's get to an approximation of their posture. This isn't going to be perfect, right? But I think it's a pretty good approximation. It's like attacking is a profit center, defending is a cost center. It's cool. Every time we go to the budget guy, they're like, well, there isn't budget for that. Well, okay, but we're still under attack. Why? Because it's a profit center. Next. Quick next, please. Just once. Yeah. Anonymity is their armor. They can come from any IP address, anywhere in the world, with any type of attack at any point in time, and all they need is that one vulnerability. That feels kind of painful. Next slide, please. Thank you. Right? And they always have the initiative. So if you've ever stood up a web uh, server in the cloud and turned it on and then looked at the logs, like, within about two hours, you're getting attacked. Right? Next. So I thought a little bit more about this. And I think that this models a fair percentage of what I think is going on from a super, super high level, which is that defenders, we take money, and we convert that into time. So it could be a tool, it could be a capability, it could be labor, it could be contractors, in order to affect some sort of an action. But attackers do something different. They, they invest their time in a way that lets them produce some sort of an action in order to get money. And there are different scenarios for money. Some are ideologically driven, I get that. Some are compromise driven, I get that. But for the vast majority of it, think about bug bounty. The way bug bounty works. Anybody in here do bug bounty? Yeah? Okay. So you spend time in the hopes of getting an action which will produce you money. So that kind of helps us understand, I think, their posture and where hopefully we can gain an upper hand in this. Next slide, please. So again, focusing on that, it's like in that time aspect, if they invest time, they want to get action and lots of money. So I want to step through some, some pragmatic examples of this where I think that this works. We see this in deception technology, but blue team defenders can actually do this. Next slide, please. So before I begin this, the three principles are use the attacker's energy against them. 
Right? That's how judo works. That's how a lot of, you know, certain martial arts work is let's use their energy against them. Somebody's running headlong at you. You don't necessarily run right at them. Sometimes you just kind of step to the side. If you're lucky, you put your foot out, you know, and then you smile. It's like a Bugs Bunny kind of thing, right? Use their action against them, right? Maximum effect with minimum effort. That brute force, I've seen that brute force applied to a lot of security operation centers where people are coming home at 9 o'clock at night. I don't know if that's the right approach. You might have to do it for a short time, but you've got to get ahead of it. And then break their posture before you execute the throw. So, again, it's like you can apply all your force, but until you understand where their balance is and how to break it, that's when you want to apply your energy. So let's do this because this is fun. We'll get into more of the technical stuff. So let's apply this to an exploit kit. Next slide, please. All right. So, Spilevo Exploit Kit. This one came out around March, was published. Very interesting. Let's look at the data. Let's look at the data elements. So, first on the left, we see an IP address. How many bad IP addresses are there out in the web? Come on. It's like billions, right? They could stand up anyone, anytime they want, anywhere they want. So, wait a second. That feels like where they're strong. Let's look at domain names. So these are subdomains, but I spent about eight months studying every newly registered domain name and that I could get my hands on every day. And there's about 80 to 100,000 that come out every day. Bro, like, what am I going to do with that? And the second they turn on the exploit kit is when it gets weaponized. So they have the initiative. But let's focus now on the URL. So if you look really closely, there is a weakness in exploit kits. And the weakness is... In order for the adversary to make use of it, that server's got to understand the traffic. And so there's something there. The client or the victim, whatever it is you want to describe it, has to send a request, and that server has to interpret it. If it has to interpret it, it means it's got to be interpretable. It's repeatable. They're all constructed based off of a similar pattern. And so the, the whole reason why it's called a kit is because they take this and they copy it to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of domains. So they wrote it once, they read it many. Click next once, please. However, if we write a regex that matches that exact pattern, which this regex does, and you test that through your environment, and the only thing you have are true positives, you just broke the exploit kit. That's exactly what this is about. If a GET request or a POST request goes through your proxy servers or your URL traffic that matches this regex pattern, it's only the exploit kit. So if they take that exploit kit and they copy it to 100,000 IP addresses, it doesn't matter. And they could register 100,000 domains. It doesn't matter. The code running on the server produces this URL pattern, and if you block that, you've destroyed the exploit kit. At that point in time, all the, the money and time and investment that they spent to create that exploit kit, you just wrecked it. So I've done this with Black Hole 2.0, 2.1, Nuclear, Spikevo, several others. You know, you can check them out. I wrote the Snort signatures from years ago. This works. And so if, how many exploit kits are there? Anybody want to take a guess? A couple dozen? Ten? Who knows? How many exploit kits are there? Not that many. There certainly aren't hundreds of thousands, and there's definitely not billions. So if you can reverse them and you can block them, you've just taken a whole class and category out of your way. Now, you'll notice in this discussion, I haven't mentioned one thing. I haven't mentioned what malware was being delivered. Why? Because if you can block the get request for the binary, I don't really care what the malware is. Because you're not going to get it. Yes, you, malware research is really important. Yes, doing that kind of stuff is really important. And staying ahead of it is really important. But you can't deliver a malware binary if you're using this. Next slide, please. So here's a demonstration now from a couple of days later. Um, another domain came up with this exploit kit deployed. You'll see the domain name has changed, but the pattern still matches. Right? So that's how you can break a whole exploit kit. Next slide, please. It's way easier than going after the domains. And so the whole concept is like what you exactly want to do 
is to destroy their developer's value. Right? You develop an exploit kit, you deploy it out, we block it. They can't copy it anywhere else. They can't sell it anywhere else. I'm going to sell you the Spicavo exploit kit. Well, dude, I don't want that, man. That's already been broken. And then you break their money. Kind of the concept of where this is going, and I've applied this at a couple of orgs, so let's keep going. So let's apply this to web traffic. All right. Going through web traffic, you can find anomalies, bumps. You don't have to use machine learning for this. It does help. It's nice if you got it. But if you don't have it, you could do a lot of other stuff. You could do statistical analysis. Um, I did a talk called Rex Sim Noise. It's got some good information on how to do that if you don't have these tools. And you'll see here there's a big old spike in the traffic. This is traffic over time. I'm sorry, it's cutting off a little on the screen, guys. But uh, you'll see a spike in the traffic here. So let's dig into that spike. Let's find out what's going on. Next slide, please. So what's really interesting about, oh, that's really hard to read. Is that hard to read? Oh, man. Okay. All right. So I'll describe it to you, and it'll be just as good, I promise. <laughs> so what you're looking at is an aggregation of the user agents during that time frame. Yeah, I have no idea if it was user agents. I just picked a field. Let's look at the URLs. Let's look at the user agents. I don't know. That sounds pretty good, right? And right in the middle of all of this is Firefox version 1.5. So, yeah, okay, I'm getting some laughs. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, up here is, like, good Firefox versions, normal, and then all of a sudden it's Firefox 1. There is no reason on planet Earth Firefox 1.5 should be touching my infrastructure. Oh, yeah, dude, Adrian, you're the best, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So what you can see here, now that you can actually see it is, these are Firefox versions, and there's 1.5 in there. But there's a reason why it's Firefox 1.5, because this is a tool. And that tool was written by folks around the time of Firefox 1.5. And people just copied it and downloaded it and deployed it to hundreds of thousands of IPs and just started hitting our infrastructure. Bam! I can see them. Next slide, please. So let me give you another good example of this. This is the Black Spider um, tool, okay? You see this with Ali.txt. If you're dealing with uh, NIDS alerts on your web infrastructure, you may have seen this one. And so there's a really good snort signature out there. I think it's very valuable. It's very important. It alarms you when there's a get request for Ollie.txt. Basically, this is an attempted exploit. And if the exploit's successful, Ollie.txt gets uploaded to your servers. If you look at your web traffic, you'll probably see this. Downloading all the traffic that these guys were doing, Ollie.txt was the last request. All right, so let's think about this. In a time sequence, one after the other, after the other, after the other, we're getting a NIDS alert on the last request of the tool. Okay, so what's the first request of the tool? What does it start with? When we mapped it out, it turned out that every single one of them sent the same sequence of events in precisely the same order because it's a tool. Somebody wrote a tool. And the first request is head admin FCK editor. It's an exploit request, right? So when that request comes in, we ban the tool. So let's think about that from a sequence perspective. So we get all the way to the top. The first request comes in. We ban the IP address. And the rest of the tool, I don't really care at that moment what's in it because it all fails. It's all gone. And so doing this at some of the organizations that I've worked with, we've auto-banned 800 IP addresses a day. Like just automatically banned them. Like the second you touch us anywhere in a no-no spot, like you're out of there. Like it's gone. And so to give you an idea of the effect of this and that, the, uh, of that, the um, pen test team called us up in my sock and they said, can you please whitelist our IP, our IP addresses? And I said, Why? I was like, well, we keep trying to start up the thing and we keep getting banned. Hey, wait a second. Wait a second. Uh, no. No, bro. Like you got to get in my like you get in my infrastructure with all this defenses, then you've really done a pen test, right? Next slide, please. So, all right. So this one, this is a little bit more intricate, but it's a really interesting scenario. So that you'll see, there's these explode uh, explosions of of data points coming out of a central point. Looks almost like orbits, three dimensions. At the center of those are source IPs. 
and exploding out from them are all the URL get requests or head or, you know, whatever, whatever verb, pick your verb here. Okay. And so it looks like it's in three dimensions around the tool. And there's only two source IPs here. What's super interesting about this is that the ones that are marked in red are overlaps, meaning these two different tools, which are designed to attack web infrastructure, make overlapping requests. So if I can find one of those and ban that infrastructure coming in towards me, that IP address, that whatever it is, I've latently, like just by accident, like because of coolness, I've banned two tools. So there's a snowball effect here as you do this and you start knocking down infrastructure where you're going to start to overlap tools and see patterns that, that occur within them. And I'll show you precisely how to start with this inside of your logs if you've got access to them from any direction, right? Next slide, please. All right. So let's talk about the methodology and approach here. Like, how can you actually do this inside of your enterprise? Next slide. So one of the biggest things that I see happening in security operations centers is that we have to start with the basics, right? Crawl, walk, run. There's a lot of organizations out there that are attempting to buy tools that are going to get them to the top and the most, and the, the, the most advanced capability immediately. I haven't yet seen a lot of scenarios where that's been super successful. And part of the reason why is we have to build from transparency. So you start by seeing what's happening. I couldn't analyze those web logs if I didn't have the F5 load balancers coming in, or I didn't have access to those web logs on those servers in order to be able to conduct the analysis. I couldn't tell you what was going on in our infrastructure unless I could see it. The second one is then signal to noise. What's the difference between an alert that I do care about and an alert I don't? I'll give you one example of this. We recently did a threat hunt in an organization that had an EDR. I'm not going to say which one. And they had 550 alerts. All right. So, like, all sorts of things are happening, but 550 things came out and said, this is an attack. Of all, that 550, only one needed action. And it was, if I remember it, it was a really nasty piece of malware. And so, what is that? Signal that signals like 0.2% or something, right? Don't, don't ask me to do math that fast. I can't do that, right? It's like 0.2%. So you got to figure out what the signal is to the noise. But once you get to that, you get to actionable alarms. So, um, some of the objectives I set in security operations are I want signal to noise 35 to 85%, meaning if an alarm goes off, it's got to be 35 to 85% accurate. Something like that. That's the target goal anyway. Because then when you're looking at alerts, you're looking at things that are actionable and the patterns begin to materialize. So I worked with a, a couple of data scientists throughout the years and one of them basically told me is like patterns do materialize. It's, it's like a creativist approach to data. Like as you do it, the patterns will materialize. Oh, hey, it's a phishing attack. Oh, we've gotten a bunch of those. Those are, um, you know, those are uh, business email compromise. Hey, look, we've gathered all the URLs. Hey, look. The URLs are all structured the same way. That's a pattern. Can we do something about it? And once you do that, you start identifying their tools, and then you can start building towards the automation. Yes, can some tools get you to automation quickly? They can. But I have seen this exact pattern happen in almost every SOC I've worked in and built out and, and consulted in. So I hope that this kind of helps set the stage of where we can begin. Go ahead. At least as far as I can tell. Okay, so... So let's really do this. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, this week my immune system is like the Grinch. It's two sizes too small, you know. It's just I'm fighting off a cold. I apologize. So grab a threat IP address that fired something. Good jumping off point. You got to have something to start with. Go find all the signatures that that fired. Typically it'll be like, you know, NIDs or whatever. Whatever it is that you're looking at. It could be WAF. You got to tune it to your own infrastructure. That's why I'm not up here standing here telling you how I did this with X tool, right? Once you do that, go look at all this, the signature fires for those signatures. Go regression test them through the past. How many times have those signatures fired? A lot? A little? What were they associated with? And what you'll start to get to is 100% true positive signatures. Like this starts to actually happen. And once you do that, find all the IPs that fired those signatures and collect all that metadata. And what you end up with is a good pool. User agents, bad IPs, 
web request, layer 7 data, you can use that. Next slide, please. So as you do that, you can start building custom alarms, custom alerts that are built on that information, and you'll see things that are attacks that aren't firing NID signatures. You can start building custom rules for those, right? Because they're, they're really useful. They're very helpful. Um, then you regression test it. those, turn them on, and as they go, tune them. And now you're starting to get closer. You find all the 100% true positives, start tuning on those signatures, and you start building a life cycle where you iteratively go down. It's almost like a Fibonacci sequence. The first time you do it, it's going to be a whole bunch of data, and you're going to be like, oh, my gosh. And then the second time you do it, it'll be a whole lot less. And then, you know, within a time period, it depends on your organization, it'll start to get really surgical. And you can say, I know exactly what that is. So we just did this with the healthcare, too. We, we helped them uh, tune up their SIM. And now they are literally firing on every single NIDS alarm that fires, except a couple of IPs, which we know are super noisy in their infrastructure, and a couple of signatures that we know are not valuable. Outside of that, if it fires a signature, we're going to see it. And we know it's bad because we know it doesn't happen. Okay? And you kind of keep this life cycle going as you work in your sock, and, um, and you'll build new content that's valuable. Next slide, please. So as you do that, you can start taking tactical actions. I talked about quarantining the IP addresses. It's a good example. Um, one example was, uh, you know, if you have a Windward spawning a CMD or PowerShell or VB script, uh, you have a VB script that's launching, uh, downloading an executable and writing it to your temp folder. What's the malware? Well, in that scenario, I don't know. But it's malware. And if I can stop that VB script from running and writing it to the temp folder, it's blocked malware. And, and that's kind of pretty good, right? You'll start to see these patterns come out, and you'll figure out inside your enterprise, how, what tool can I use, how can I use it, and ban it. So um, some other statistics that I can give you about what this has produced. Um, one organization reduced their malware infection by 75%. It was dr absolutely dramatic. It rolled off a cliff, and that was like four or five rules. Um, one organization, we, I dropped their mean time to contain by 80% in three months. Um, it was just wham, you know, so you can actually do this. Um, it's not necessarily the easiest thing the first time, but as you dig through it with a methodology, it's cool. All right. And okay. So one other story to tell you, um, one organization that I worked in, we mapped out a bot and that bot was scraping our, um, externally facing web infrastructure. You know, there was some data on there. I'm not going to give you too much detail. But there was some data that was on there. And they started seeing increases in volume over time. And we dug into that increase, and what we found was a bot that was 500 IP addresses large that was scraping data from their external infrastructure to download it. Not a single one of those IP addresses was on any threat intelligence list. None of that traffic fired any alert, but it was a business risk. It actually threatened their business. They were, they're trying to repeat and copy all the data. And so, like, once we knocked those guys down, the time that it took for them to stand back up their infrastructure, come back and try it again with a different technique, was two weeks. It was about 14 days was the average. And so they were determined. We knew who they were. We knew what their objective was. We'd keep our eye on the ball to try to protect them when we advised the business how to fix that. But that's what I mean when I say internal intelligence. Like, that's not going to fire any types of alerts. Next slide, please. So, how am I doing on time? I have no idea. I do. Okay. So, th overall, th the concept here is applying all of our energy and brute force before we understand the posture of what's actually attacking us, it may hurt us in our energy. And, you know, we see a lot of conversations. I particularly pay a lot of attention to what's going on with burnout. There's going to be a good talk. I really want to see it today on burnout. Um, and, and how are we going to deal with that as an industry? Because we can't hire as many people as we think we need. And we can't address every single possible scenario that's out there in order to attack. So where do we put our energy? <coughs> Excuse me. And I think that this... Among other techniques, this will help apply and focus where that energy should be. It's like getting 5,000 alarms in your sim a day really isn't going to help you, right? 
Okay, so questions, thoughts, any comments? Yes. Absolutely. And so in that scenario, so the question was along the lines of, okay, uh, using a regex for a URL request works, but not if it's TLS encrypted. And you can't actually see the traffic. That's 100% accurate. And so then the question becomes, all right, is this a super difficult, is this a super prevalent threat vector in our enterprise? Right? That's the first question. Should I spend time on figuring it out is what I'm trying to get to. Second one is, where do I have visibility? Do I have an EDR that's going to show me what happens on the back end of that? I have a bad you I have a bad domain. And you can see the domains even if it's TLS encrypted. I have a bad domain. Okay, let me pivot to the endpoint. Let me go look at what file activity, registry activity, services, et cetera, what happened on the EDR, what happened on the endpoint during that time frame. And what that will begin to do is then draw correlations between the two. And that will give you what the command structure looks like on the box, which exploits being delivered, how that materializes. It's a word I use is how it behaves on the endpoint when it gets that. You know, does it write, um, an executable file to, you know, update a local temp, right? And then when that happens, what does it do? Uh, and can you interdict that command structure from that side? Because you don't have the capability that I described here, but you probably have other capabilities. Now, if you don't have any of those capabilities, and you find there's malware in your enterprise, it's probably a pretty good idea to investigate what's the easiest way you can start to figure that out. And I use the word start specifically. Um, a lot of folks try to go from zero to 100% perfect. It's like, well... We can do some crawl, walk, run here, right? Do some collecting of logs, uh, OS query. Uh, you could use OS sec. There's a whole bunch of different things that'll in tune up your visibility and then help you move along that path till you get there for your enterprise. Does that help answer the question? Okay, absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah. As a sysadmin, it seems like there's a lot of of these anti-malware that claim they use artificial intelligence and things to do exactly what you're saying. And to me, I mean, I don't buy this stuff because all the podcasts, everything I listen to, they constantly say these products fall flat. So I'm just curious, you know, maybe from your standpoint, why do you think that these products really never ultimately deliver? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was um, around artificial intelligence and machine learning as a proposed solution to all of these issues and why folks in the industry feel like they're not actually delivering on what they say. Okay, so here, here's what I'll say about that. So the first, the first issue that I've seen is a lot of folks are looking for univariate solutions to problems. What's wrong? I don't know. I can't figure out what's in my logs. What's the solution? Machine learning. It feels like a, a univariate, but the truth of the matter is that's absolutely not how it happens. So when you go back to that user agent string for Firefox 1.5, the way this looks if you map it out, um, if you aggregate the data, is it looks like an exponential decay curve. Okay, and the, without going too mathy, like, cause I'm totally like a mathy geek and th that's bad, right? It, it depends on the steepness of that curve to interpret it, but it's right in the middle. So when you run a machine learning algorithm and say, show me everything that's inside of this thing that's anomalous, you're not going to get that user agent string because it's right in the middle of the traffic. You're going to get the really weird one. So that's like one good example of this where in the midst of your distribution curve, you're going to have the badness and the only people that can really identify that. So an unsupervised machine learning model where basically you, you plug it in, turn it on, and it pops out and goes, here's the bad guy, right? Totally unsupervised. You're not doing anything that will show you some stuff, but a supervised learning model will really work. In order to do that, it has to be driven by subject matter experts and that connection 
hasn't been made yet. In my opinion, at the level that a lot of these products are saying it has. Okay. And then the, the last reason is you're also talking about string data. This is ASCII text. And in order to do really good machine learning, you want to convert that into numbers. How do you actually do that effectively? It's weird because your log is going to parse differently than my log and then his log and some, something else. So there's, it's kind of like a way of saying, oh, it's like super complicated, dude. And like, that's the reason why. And so they're coming to everybody and they're saying, I've solved this problem. But we've also heard that before. I mean, people have said, well, you get a SIM and it'll solve your problem. We have out of the box rules. You turn them on and you get bombarded with noise and then you cry. Like, that's, but like, tell me that doesn't really happen. Like, that's kind of really how it happens. They're like, well, you just, all you have to do is turn it on and everything's solved. Um, the, the salespeople that have told me something different than that, those are the ones I work with because they really get into the meat of it. Um, I think that eventually there are some machine learning algorithms and like our artificial intelligence I define as something that can interact like we are right here. So, uh, you know, this, uh, Josh, Oh, his last name's going to escape me from MIT, has talked about where AI is from a brain perspective. And the last I checked on it, it was like a six-month-old child. So I wouldn't put my six-month-old child on a sim, though I am trying to train my kids how to be a security analyst, I can assure you. <laughs> so, so, yeah. You know, it was interesting. Somebody shipped us um, a package, and uh, in it was shredded paper. And I wanted to demonstrate to my kids what privacy is like. We, we sat at the dining room table and tried to reconstruct parts of the shredded paper. It was really interesting. Was there another question? Yes. I, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Yeah, 100% correct. So just so everybody can hear, like what this gentleman is saying, I definitely agree with wholeheartedly. It's like if you don't have your own tools, you can rely on other people's tools to give you that jumping off point or you can rely on the tools that you've got. See, ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what Jigoro Kano's story was so powerful. It's like he has 95 pounds of five foot two or whatever size he is. He's really small, but he's got what he's got. And so he used what he had as best as he possibly could. And that's the reason why I'm not up here standing and saying, Implement the SIM and your problems are solved and this is the technology to do it. It's like in your enterprise, it's going to look different if you're looking for things that are affecting only you in the way they affect you. It behaves different ways. Cool. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah, go ahead. Back to user agents. It makes, if you get value, it's kind of simple, but having a blacklist for user agents... That's kind of mean. That one is stuck out because that's 1947 Firefox, but it's back. So, have you seen success around that or anybody implementing like, hey, these are obvious tools. I mean, we've seen them I mean, from common tools, just knock down the silly stuff. But is, is that something we're doing? Yeah, so the question was, um, have I ever implemented blacklists based on user agents, like we saw the anomaly, and is it actually worth doing? So let me tackle uh, first piece and then second. So first piece, yes, absolutely. You can do a blacklist. You can also do uh, an alarm list. It depends on whether you want to see it or whether you want to block it. Um, these these attackers are human beings, and so um, have you ever, so let me ask a question. Anybody in here spell a word wrong, but they spell it wrong the same way every time. Anybody? Oh, yeah, there's hands going up. Okay, do not ask me to spell the word definitely. You're going to get red squiggly lines on the bottom. Uh, attackers suffer from the same thing. Uh, that technique, by the way, I used in counterfeit enterprises, going after them, uh, fraudulent Facebook advertisements. They make this mistake all the time. They'll misspell something. And they'll misspell it the same way every time, and then they copy it 100,000 times. Like, have you ever tried to convince IT to rewrite an old tool 
for some reason that's in the enterprise. They're like, I'm, I'm not doing that. That was the worst week of my life. The hackers are going through the same thing. They're like, well, I can't kind of rewrite that tool because it's deployed 500,000 places. So yeah, it can be very valuable. And then, and then the second part of the question is now escaping me. I got too far down that path. Can you repeat it? I think it's just all related to that. Is it worth doing? Oh, is it worth doing? Yeah, so um, in terms of enforcement, the reason why I think this stuff is incredibly value is if you look at how, I think it was Rudy Giuliani approached law enforcement in New York City. Now, I, I don't remember if it was broken glass or broken window. That's one of those things my brain just can't click properly on. But he enforced the basic laws, which ultimately demonstrated to the community as well as the, um, at the, the real criminals that they were enforcing the law. This happens. Believe me when I tell you it happens. You start enforcing broken glass or broken window in your enterprise and um, you will start making other people go away. A very wise man by the name of Bill I worked with told me you don't have to be the fastest gazelle in the herd, you just don't want to be the slowest. And so when when you're banning hundreds of IP addresses and blocking people uh, and knocking down malware and it's really hard to get in, folks, what's happening is some guy is sitting behind a terminal, and I, I just say guy, right, could be a gal, sitting behind some terminal, and their boss is coming over them going, did you hack into that enterprise yet? And the guy's like, I don't know what's going on. It's like every time I want to scan, they ban my IP address. I can't figure out what's happening. Because like, you better get on it, you know? It's frustrating for them. And Jigoro even says that in his logs. He says that when I started beating the guys that were bigger than me, they were inordinately frustrated. And what you want to do is frustrate them. So you will ultimately build a reputation, right? Across other people's industries. It's like, well, that's so such and such an organization. Oh, man. You have no idea how many headaches I had trying to get into those guys. It was painful. Like this, they're humans just like us. So yeah, I think it's really valuable. Anybody else? Questions, thoughts, comments? Show of hands. Anybody find this useful? Yes? I really appreciate the opportunity to present it to you. Thank you so much. <laughs>